Welcome to the Casted Podcast, hosted here at ITU University of Copenhagen. My name is Turo Husserl, I'm your host, and we try to talk about foundations of information technology here. But we are, of course, not the first to do this, and back in 1951, Alan Turing, the father of computing, wrote in Intelligent Machinery, My contention is that machines can be constructed which will simulate the behavior of the human mind very closely. Let us assume, for the sake of argument, that these machines are a genuine possibility and look at the consequences of constructing them. To do so would, of course, meet with great opposition unless we have advanced greatly in religious toleration from the days of Galileo. There would be great opposition from the intellectuals who were afraid of being put out of a job It is probable, though, that the intellectuals would be mistaken about this. There would be plenty to do, trying to understand what the machines were trying to say, that is, in trying to keep one's intelligence up to the standard set by the machines. For it seems probable that once the machine thinking method has started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. There would be no question of the machines dying, and they would be able to converse with each other to sharpen their wits. And at some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. So I think this is remarkable. It's from 1951. Uh, Nobody, almost nobody, had ever seen an electronic computer at that time. Turing, of course, had. He had built one of the first ones. Um, There was no internet. There was no Facebook. There was... Computers didn't have screens or printers. They were just large room-sized devices that you fed punched cards into and that did Com- com- computations for you. But in 1951, Turing already said almost everything there is to be said about general artificial intelligence and the possible outcomes of this, many of which could be disastrous. So, to help us talk and think about this, uh, the guest today is Ulle Hexström. So, Ulle is a professor of mathematical statistics at uh, Chalbers University of Technology in Gothenburg. Yes. member of the Swedish Royal Academy of Sciences, yes. uh, the author of several books, including some on mathematics, I guess, statistics or mm-hmm. probability theory. And uh, he's also a prolific public intellectual. Uh, uh, your first, the bo- first book of you I wrote was actually about uh, pseudoscience. Um, that was when I just moved to Sweden, I, I bought that. That was the first book you read, but it wasn't the first one I wrote. No, it's the first book of you I read, <laughs> ah. exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and now, recently, Ole has, con- has uh, published uh, Here Be Dragons, uh, about science, technology, and the future of humanity. So, thanks a lot for coming. Thank you, I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, you're on the short list of people I really wanted on the podcast when I started this project. Um, so. I talked already with some other guests about AI in the very narrow sense, and let's just, to keep our terminology uh, somewhat uh, stringent today, let's refer to that as automation. So let's use Mm -hmm. automation for the kind of AI that we see today. That includes uh, robots that we have in car factories. It also includes the uh, artificial intelligence in video games, and that is today used, and and the artificial intelligence used by Google to make a lot of uh, uh, decisions. AI for solving specific tasks. Specific AI, narrow AI. Mm. Mm-hmm. And then, what should we say, general AI or super intelligence for the thing that we really want to talk about today. Mm-hmm. That is the AI that we do not yet have. And it's the AI that Turing wrote about in 51. Yeah. And that many people now, two generations later, also start worrying about. Mm. Mm? So you are on the short list of people who try to introduce that into the public sphere. Yes. Uh, Why? Why? Because uh, I think um, I think we need to take the kind of um, scenarios that Turing speaks about in, in, in the quote you read uh, seriously. Not because they will happen, but because uh, something like that very well may happen. And uh, I think that uh, the future uh, is not written in stone, so I don't want to make fatalistic predictions about anything, Uh, but I think that it's a very good working assumption to assume that actions that we take today uh, can affect uh, how things go 
for humanity in the future and that it's a good idea to act with foresight. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, such foresight requires, I think, uh, that we uh, don't ignore uh, the most extreme uh, scenarios uh, of the kind that uh, Turing talked about in 1951. Um, because if, 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 we, if we decide that, oh, but that's just science fiction, that's uh, something that uh, we as serious academics shouldn't talk about, uh, I I if we decide on that, uh, we may miss uh, maybe the most important uh, issues for the future. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, so should, we, should, we should be open-minded. We should absolutely be open-minded. So you mentioned science fiction, and interestingly, I guess the other big uh, thing that happened in 1950 with respect to AI are the Asimov novels. I think I wrote also from 1950. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. I may be wrong. Yeah. Uh, that's pure. That's pure science fiction, but it, it really focuses famously yeah. on the control problem. So yeah. that also that uh, work of fiction also assumes the existence of super intelligent machinery. Yeah. And, uh, and very interestingly, I think, Asimov immediately recognized that having that technology would imply a non-trivial control problem. And many of his uh, robot novels are exactly about that. And yeah. So famous that many people are able to quote the three laws of robotics. Yes. Uh, maybe so including you. Shall we recollect them? If you can them. Yes. Yeah, something like this. First law is uh, never harm a human. Uh, second one is uh, uh, obey the orders uh, from humans provided they don't conflict with the first law. And the third law is to protect yourself provided it doesn't conflict with the first law. Right, the robot the should law. protect itself. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so when we so call it's these a hierarchy. Of it's a hierarchy of laws. So when we, when we call these laws, of course, they're not like the laws of thermodynamics. They're just mm -hmm. laws in a f fictional universe. Mm -hmm. Uh, posited by Asimov um, uh, about how this could possibly work, and then I guess most of the um, most of the robot novels are about uh, uh, robots cleverly avoiding these laws or all the right. problems that arise from these laws. R right. So assume, I, I assume at some point you also want to discuss how likely it is that we will actually achieve superintelligence. That, that would be the part of the conversation where I give pushback to you. Yeah. And until that, I will pretend yeah. to be a, a friendly, friendly interlocutor. Yes. Very good. Yes. Uh, so we can be scared. Yes, yes. Um, so assuming uh, that we create uh, a super intelligent machine, meaning that it uh, vastly exceeds um, uh, human intelligence across the whole spectrum of uh, uh, the kinds of competences that, uh, that we call uh, intelligence, uh, then uh, it's naive to think that uh, we ourselves can remain in control, so we will be in the hands of uh, the machines, so it's clearly going to be important what they are driven by, what, what their goals are, uh, what they want to achieve. They, they, so, they so might want to keep us around, like we keep Gorilla around, but, but yes. the future of Gorilla is entirely dependent on the choices made by Homo sapiens. Yes, I think they are, mm, yes, that's exactly uh, the case. And there are all sorts of questions about even if they feed us and uh, give us toys and so on, do we really want to live in a zoo? What, what, will we still be able to feel that human existence has a purpose uh, at the uh, mm -hmm. stage of, mm -hmm. of uh, evolution where we're no longer at the top and so on? All sorts of philosophical But that's the benevolent scenario, right? Yeah. That's the scenario where we actually yeah. survive this transition. The relatively benevolent yes. uh, scenario. The bad scenario is when the machines have drives and goals and purposes that are uh, poorly aligned uh, with uh, human uh, welfare and so on. And maybe they just decide that we are in their way and they can then wipe us out. Uh, so, so the control problem is about uh, inserting values into these machines, directly or uh, in some indirect way. Uh, when this whole uh, evolution gets started. Mm -hmm. Because, because once, once they have superintelligence, they're not going to allow us to manipulate their values. So we have to do something at the early stages, uh, presumably. Uh, 
So when most people uh, who have read a little bit uh, Asimov and so on are confronted with a control problem, they will immediately suggest that, uh, well, uh, let's, let's build Asimov's three laws of robotics into the machines and that will solve the problem, everything will be fine. But that, I mean, if you go back and, and read the Asimov uh, robot stories, you'll find that most of them end quite, uh, in, uh, that, as you said, the robots uh, find ways to circumvent uh, the uh, laws uh, in surprising ways and consequences will be uh, surprising and sometimes bad. And uh, it's, uh, I, I, I think this, this is a correct observation. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's an analogy uh, so, uh, Elsie Yudkowsky, who has worked a lot on the uh, control problem, uh, he talks about the fragility of human values, meaning uh, that if you specify them 90% correctly, that's not going to be uh, enough to avert disaster. If you want to telephone me and you get uh, 90%, 9 out of 10 digits in my phone number uh, correctly, you're not going to reach somebody who is 90% me. Nope. You, you, you will need, you come to a, a total stranger. Uh, and this seems to be the case also with human values, that if you specify them 90% correctly, uh, in some sense, which of course is very fuzzy, but um, so I'm, I'm, as a statistician, mathematician, I'm a little bit uneasy about using figures this sloppily, but, but uh, Nevertheless, uh, doing that uh, is not guaranteed to uh, give a, a favorable outcome as measured by human values. I guess we're completely uh, used to the fact that we try as societies to build rules all the time, the tax code or, or mm -hmm. uh, criminal law, and then humans being universally good problem solvers will invest a lot of thought into circumventing the tax yes. code. Yes. So similarly, assuming that we are building a superintelligence, then this superintelligence will be super good at this. It'll be super good at circumventing the, yes. these rules because it knows better than us. And that was the assumption. Yeah. Yeah. So it even knows better than us that what we actually wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but th there's, there is already a lot of things on the table here that, that I want us to unpack a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, one is about actually reaching this stage of superintelligence and then describing uh, the stage, and I guess l let's let's start there. So the assumption is that we would, and that's also Turing's assumption, that we we or somebody else will be able to build some kind of artificial device, and let's think of that as a computer, or even if we want as a robot. But it's an art. It's not just another human. It's it's an artificial device, mm -hmm. possibly using dig digital technology or not. Who knows? Mm -hmm. And that this device is at least as good in any measure of intelligence as we are. Mm. So, and this is already very ill-defined because we don't really agree outside of psychometrics on what intelligence should mean and if that's mm. what we want to measure. And also computers today are already very, very impressive at several tasks mm. that just 100 years ago we thought were intelligent, like mm. sorting mm. Uh, or, or doing very, very uh, uh, complicated multiplications or in, in, in inverting a matrix. Um, or playing chess. Yes. So, so 100 years ago, many of the tasks that we thought were markers of intelligence yeah. are today completely trivialized by computers who do this much better than any human will ever do. I, I think uh, multiplication of uh, large numbers. Maybe there was a time, long, long time ago, when that was considered a deep problem. But, but for qu quite a few centuries, I think that we have realized that this is essentially a trivial problem. Uh, and, and most of the... Uh, uh, oh, no, 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 I, I, I think already there. No, I think that folk wisdom would have it that the child who's good at multiplication is also intelligent. I think that's yes. a pretty good proxy. So intel multiplication is, is, I guess, a yes. useful proxy for intelligence. I do agree that's, that's, that it's not deep. That's, that, that, that's a good point. And, uh, yes, so what I mean here is not deep. I mean that, that we do not say that a uh, machine exhibits real intelligence because it can multiply large numbers. There was a, a, a time not so uh, many decades ago where we thought that a machine playing chess uh, at a human or superhuman level would exhibit real yes. intelligence. 
And then in the mid 1990s, Deep Blue beat uh, then world champion Kasparov uh, uh, in a close match. Uh, now uh, computer programs are much, much better than even the strongest human grandmasters. But we have sort of given up on the idea that, that chess exhibits the kind of depth that is, is uh, worth calling uh, real intelligence. And you speak here as a pretty good chess player, right? Uh, I've, I've, I've played uh, competitive chess for, for, for a couple of decades. I was never on the top national level, but, but uh, I, I know how to play chess. But, but you would agree just from introspection that the thought process you were involved in in chess are not completely different from your general problem solving. Right, uh, and I think that the way I play chess or the way that a human grandmaster plays chess is fairly different from the way that a computer program uh, plays chess. The, the computer programs they use much, much more of brute force search. You know, if I play this move, you have these uh, 10 different moves to choose from, and for each of them, I have a number of moves to choose from, and that this uh, forms uh, a, a tree of, of variations. And uh, the computer is much, much better at going through many, many branches of this tree. Uh, the human mind doesn't have the time and capacity to do that within reasonable time and has to uh, work much more with uh, positional evaluation uh, of, of uh, the ch uh, chess uh, configuration. And also um, hunches, intuition, yes, yes. things so that look a bit like uh, something I've seen before and there didn't work. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. So, so the intelligence, if you take a, a computer program and a, a human that, if you choose to take a program on the level where it's on the same, um, uh, where, where it performs equally well in competitions as the human, they will be, uh, have very different competence profiles within chess. And there will yes. be certain positions, especially in the end games, where the human will be much better, and there will be other positions, uh, mostly in the middle game, where the computer is uh, much better, and so on. So it, it's diff you could say it's different styles of thinking. Mm -hmm. And then I guess in the recent decades, this, yeah. this story of first multiplication was thought to be hard, and then it turned out computers can do it, then chess was mm -hmm. supposed to be hard, and then computers could do it. Mm -hmm. More and more of these milestones are yeah. are being reached. And so. last year we, this happened with the game of Go, Go which yes. one thought was uh, so much more uh, intuitive and positional in nature. Well, I guess Go more obviously was not beatable by game tree evaluation. Right? Right. Go, the, yeah. the, common, the explosion yeah. in, in yeah. positions in Go mm -hmm. is so dramatic that, yes. that computers can't beat the exponential function in, in, ex mm -hmm. in the explosion of the state space. Mm -hmm. So Go obviously could not be solved by this brute force approach. But even, even, the, even the best chess programs don't use purely brute that force. Is true. That they is true. have ways of pruning the tree so yes. that they can go deeper into the relevant yes. variations. And then indeed the, the Go program from last mm -hmm. year pruned the tree mm -hmm. in an intelligent way or rather mm -hmm. uh, zoomed in on that. And then mm -hmm. this year there was a poker breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so at the same time there are other things so just a few years ago, I found this nice quote that in the 50s, uh, or I guess in the 60s and 70s, we were still very confused about what the limits of AI were. Mm. And there were some things that we thought were easy, and they turned mm. out to, to be really, really hard. Mm. And some things that were hard that turned out to be, that we thought was hard, like, like uh, uh, playing chess, mm. that turned out to be really easy. And I think we were misled from our intuitive understanding of how humans learn. So it turns out that, that a 14-month-old child is actually pretty good at grammar already. They, yeah. they know a lot about how, how, human, uh, how human speech works and they can yeah. recognize cats. Yeah. Uh, whereas this took us a long time for computers to do anything with speech or yeah. recognize cats. Yeah. Uh, but we could play chess very quickly with computers. Yeah. And for children it's the other way around, right? They mm. will first learn to recognize mm. cats and be able to talk. Uh -huh. And then they will be able to play chess. Yeah. So we were a bit misguided about in which order we would solve these problems. But the thing that also very much goes against my own intuition is that now we can actually build machines that recognize pictures of cats. Mm. And this is, I think, this is, I think, I think this is the reason for why this, um, um, why AI is again 
part of public discourse. So AI comes in, in, in waves. There mm -hmm. are uh, always mm -hmm. a few years of AI hype, mm -hmm. where, where mm -hmm. AI seems to be both uh, powerful and scary technology, and then there's an AI winter after that, and then it comes back again, mm -hmm. yeah. much like Halley's Comet. Yeah. Every few years there is, a, there is AI hype. Yeah. And now it's very unclear whether it will go well, away Although again. that analogy has its limitation, because every time Halley's uh, Comet uh, comes back, it's a little bit weaker, oh, it's smaller little, than last very time. Nice. And with AI, it's the <laughs> other way around. It's the other way around, yeah. Because now we, we, we have reached this amazing level of human cognition, the ability to recognize cats. Mm. And, and then the question is really multiplication, chess, cats, yeah. and then Terminator scenarios seem to be the logical next, right. next step. Um, but it might, but might seem some, some it, in, uh, intermediate stages. Who, who knows? But yeah. So, so, so um, I, I want to get back to pathways yeah. to general AI in, mm. in a minute. But just assuming that this, that this um, either proceeds or we find some other way of getting there, then one, one might argue that sooner or later we will have been able to automatize or softwareize or turn into a machine any uh, human computational task, mm -hmm. such as having this conversation or, or writing a book or writing, um, writing a symphony that what somebody wants to hear, uh, doing math proofs or I mean, I can very strongly feel the desire to see um, the finding a clever mathematical proof or having this conversation as something deep and mysterious and something that uh, you cannot easily automatize. Uh, but uh, I think we... Um, uh, that's... Uh, we may be flattering ourselves. Yeah, because I find this hard to think about because I find it much easier to have this conversation with you than, say, to uh, play a game of chess against you where I would be completely destroyed. Uh, whereas I can sort of keep alive in, in, uh, in this conversation. So, so this seems to be a cognitively easier task. Um, but so one of the popular counter arguments against that, that, that I just want to have out of the way, is that no, this can't be because we as humans clearly have some kind of volition or agency. We have desires, um, whereas computers just do what we program them to do. Right. Uh, that's, that's a very common argument and I think it's uh, totally misguided. Uh, and one reason is that if you can apply this to a machine, you can equally well apply it to you. Because all you can do is what you were programmed by your genes and your environment to do. So it doesn't seem that there's any room still for creativity. But it doesn't feel like that. It doesn't feel like I that. will now decide to have a cup of... A, I, I drink my water now. Uh, and and I really can, wanted to. Yes, yes. So, so, so and my genes didn't program this. Now we're touching upon the issue of free will. Yeah, but we have to talk about this because it's, it, this is a really important... I mean, Do the, we really the, have to talk? Well, I think it's a very confusing it's, issue. It's hours and hours, right? But, yeah. but this is the obvious counter-argument that you meet when you have this conversation over yes. a beer yeah. um, at home, for instance. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, um, but let's say, let's say we program uh, a machine uh, 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 we write an elaborate computer prog program for solving some task and it, it finds an, an unexpected way of uh, solving this task. Uh, you could still claim that uh, it was still operating according to the uh, precisely coded instructions and so on, but it did something unexpected. And this is already happening. I mean, the, the, the chess computers uh, do this. You can find patterns in, in uh, how uh, a strong uh, chess program plays that were not foreseen by the programmers. They can just sit by and note that in this type of position uh, the computer tends to try to double its rooks on the C file and they had no idea uh, the programmers had no idea. That Nobody ever programmed the instruction yeah. double the number of rooks in the C file when you are in this position. Yeah. Right, yeah. and a similar thing happens with cat recognition, which, yeah. which nobody programs today. The, the, the way these programs work is that a very, um, an initially very, very dumb program is just trained, uh, which means we show it millions and millions of cat pictures and say, this is a cat, this is not a cat, this is a cat, this is not a cat. Yeah. We do this a million times, 
the program is then instructed to modify itself, or another program modifies this original program, mm -hmm. uh, until uh, it gets better and better at correctly recognizing cats, and when it's good enough, we uh, finish the training process, and then we have now a program that recognizes cats, where nobody ever explained the program what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this is the strongest rejoinder, and, and also the reason for why I think this conversation is interesting again, because we have now real-life, operationally significant, working, efficient ways of, of, of constructing computers that we do not program, mm. but that learn. So. Yeah, but there still seems to be something uh, missing. We have this vague idea about the kind of flexibility in thinking and, and the propensity to think outside the box and so on. That we, we think of this as uh, a very human thing uh, that machines uh, have not yet uh, achieved and s some would say that uh, they will never achieve it uh, but I, th I, I insist that take the word intuitive that we've used several times in this conversation that's that's a slightly dangerous word because it carries connotations of mystique uh, but uh, things we come up with intuitively are, are still stuff that we have uh, come up with through uh, our brain processes or the, the software of our minds, uh, if you want. We just don't have access to, to the reasonings. So intuition is just reasoning that is somehow uh, we don't ourselves understand uh, what is going on. But there's st I claim that there's still nothing supernatural or mysterious. Uh, going yeah, and so by making that claim, you're aligning yourself with a position in cognition or neurophysiology and neuroanatomy that simply says the brain is really just um, a computing device. It's ultimately just a, a thing that, in principle, could be understood, uh, could be understood reductionistically. Yes. Um, uh, I think so. And, and, and this so is something even when we take this, when, when some Einstein or somebody takes this very brilliant step of thinking outside the box in some context, this is still the result of the mind's uh, software. The mi yeah, the mind's software. Even though nobody wrote that, it's yeah. the result of, yeah. of millions of years of evolution, yes. and, but it's just neurons firing in a yeah. process that is mysterious to us, yeah. but not in principle mysterious. Mm. There's no magic involved and there's mm. certainly no extra invisible stuff going on that performs the computation for us. Mm. So, so given that view, and this is sometimes called what materialism, functionalism, mm. this is, I guess this goes by many names. Mm. So, so given that idea, given the idea that the brain is just a computer in the broadest sense, so it's just a determin not deterministic, not even the real, real way, it's just a thing that can be understood in principle. Mechanical. Mechanical, is yeah, also. Yeah. All these words have lots of connotations, yeah. and I don't think we have really found yeah. the terminology to reason yeah. about this yeah. correctly. Yeah. But given that, then of course, in principle, one should be able to simulate it mm. or build something that has similar capabilities in a different way. Yes. And electronic computers may be one way of doing it. Mm. So let's talk a bit about pathways to AI. So, yeah. so yeah. how could we get there? Uh, so, so, for the reasons that you just sketched, uh, I think that uh, there is not much doubt that it can, in principle, be done. Uh, wh what is uh, much more in doubt is how far away is it. It, it, it could be, uh, I mean, in principle, uh, it could require uh, millions of years or more of unhampered uh, human technological uh, development to achieve this, or it could happen in 100 years or 50 years or 20 years. We, we don't know this. What are the pathways? Well, uh, you, I'm not a computer scientist, so in a sense uh, you, you, you're more expert mm -hmm. than I in this, uh, but when I look at the problem on, on a more general level, I seem to there are various ways that seem mildly promising uh, and which are perhaps even more promising if you can combine them in various ways. 
so the one way in which uh, impressive intelligence has come about in nature is through biological evolution. Uh, and I do think that uh, employing the principles uh, of uh, uh, biological evolution translated to a computer science setting by doing genetic programming, evolutionary mm -hmm. programming, that kind of stuff. Having, having a collection of uh, programs competing against each other in some environment uh, and, and letting the program which uh, produces the most intelligent output in some specified sense uh, reproduce and um, mutate uh, and so on and, and repeating this procedure. That's the principle. And, and this has been happening, people have been doing this in, in various uh, uh, more restrictive tasks for, I don't know, several decades. Several decades in what, com yeah. compared to nature, are very, very small scale yeah. experiments. Yeah. experiments. So, yes. so nature has yeah. been doing this for millions, yes. if not billions of years, right. with right. a lot of protons yes. involved. And, yeah. Yeah. and it, it took a long time as well, yeah. until yeah. just life appeared. Yeah. And then yeah. from the start of life to actually mm. clever things like, like you, yes. it, it took millions of years again, right. billions of years. Right. So, so the time scales of biological evolution may seem discouraging here. Uh, but what I think is uh, uh, reasonable to hope for is that uh, we can find ways to speed up evolution uh, by pushing it in directions that uh, are, uh, seem more promising mm -hmm. than, than others. This is kind of com combining the blind forces of, of Darwinian evolution with uh, more intelligence. And uh, biological ev evolution is not a very optimized process. No, right, it does it's not... It's very, it's very exactly. wasteful. Yeah, it does not optimize yeah. for cognition. Yeah. So if yeah. we could build an artificial environment for these yeah. billions of small programs that optimized cognition... So what I like about this pathway is also that it is a clear rejoinder to, to the idea that we need to program these machines, because yeah. these would obviously be machines that have not been programmed by a programmer, but where there's also clearly a vector towards to vote towards um, cognition. So mm. these should be smarter and smarter and smarter as time goes on. Mm. So that's one way of doing this, genetics, mm. or artificial mm. genetics, I guess, mm. artificial evolution. Yes. Then there's what, uh, brain simulation, which is just... Yes, uh, yes this is the path that uh, Ray Kurzweil has uh, advocated mm -hmm. since uh, at least uh, the, the turn of the millennium. Uh, so the idea is that we uh, learn to understand more and more closely how the human brain works uh, and we copy this uh, onto uh, a computer. And this is just by asking neuroanatomists and neurosurgeons yeah. who, who simply study them. And they, they do this today. This is amazing uh, science. It make, makes fantastic progress. Yeah. It's, it's Although fantastically there are, interesting. Uh, difficulties. Oh, it's I very mean, difficult. Yeah. Uh, there's it's very this difficult. little worm, the C. elegans, which has like 300 neurons mm -hmm. or something, and we have they have totally mapped the the, uh, the uh, neural system uh, of this worm, uh, and yet they cannot exploit this to to emulate the no, thinking. No, because neurons neurology. seem to be very complicated yeah. things that do yes. funky stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But so, yeah, why should this so, be easy? So, yeah. ex exactly. Mm -hmm. why, uh, it's not easy, uh, but I don't think that we can uh, assume that just because it seems difficult at this point that we will never uh, be able to overcome these difficulties. Yeah, but the, uh, and, okay, and, j j just to sum this up, the idea is to really open your brain, measure every single a neuron and the connection between these neurons, build a mathematical model of when they fire, mm. and then basically move your entire brain's working into a piece of software mm. that then simulates your brain. And once we have this, we can make a thousand brains and we can increase the clock speed to make a thousand brains work a million times faster right. than, than your puny uh, piece of meat. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So the question is, would, uh, would running me at a thousand times my normal speed uh, be enough to create uh, a genius and, and uh, there's some reason to be uh, skeptical about that but you would certainly uh, get somebody who, who uh, will uh, carry out this conversation for instance yeah, in yeah. real time. And much, just, uh, much, uh, much, much a more million of you uh, yes. running at a million yeah. times yeah. faster speed is yeah. certainly a, yeah. a scary thought right? yes. and, yes. and you would not be wanted 
none of you would want to be switched off. Right. But there's still this you would would this actually constitute something that can can achieve things qualitatively different things from what I can achieve. An analogy here is mm -hmm. running a dog at a million times the yes. usual speed. Yeah. That dog, even though it's impressively fast, it will not be able to write poetry. No. Uh, so so mm -hmm. there are limitations uh, to this approach, but one can also uh, hope, if you want to create super intelligence, that once we have uh, the human brain uh, as a computer program uh, on your laptop or something, that it will be more accessible to systematic modifications compared to doing neurosurgery uh, on a biological human. So ah. th there will be... Oh, so it's plausible that while we do this simulation, we've also learned a lot about neurosurgery mm -hmm. to be able to uh, hypothetically improve your meat brain but there may be ethical constraints on that, but your simulated brain, we can switch off all the bad thinking. R uh, yeah, uh, I don't want to make the claim that it's uh, ethically non-problematic oh. to fiddle with the electronic uh, copy of my brain. That's also, because that's we, also I mean, a question. How do we, uh, how do we, we don't know things whether things? it's going to be conscious, even if it has the, the sort of um, behavioral powers of my brain, it's an open question. Uh, I think it will be conscious under, under such circumstances, uh, but but uh, people are divided on that. And if you ask philosopher John Searle, he would say that anybody who thinks that a computer program can be conscious is just out of his mind. So so so. But consciousness is also not very well understood. It's it's not at all. Uh, yeah. And it's very unclear whether it's necessary for cognition. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, and, then, and then the third way of achieving superintelligence would just be what we're doing right now, that is writing smarter and smarter computer programs to solve a lot of narrow AI problems, such as playing video games, yeah. recognizing cats, playing chess, yeah. and combining all of those. Yeah, and I think like this, this program that uh, uh, um, some uh, computer scientists wrote like five years ago or something, that was able to learn to play any Atari mm -hmm. uh, video game. Mm -hmm. That's already, I think, a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. It's not the kind of flexibility that one, a machine would need to operate in this physical world or in the academic world or something, but, uh, but, but it's, it seems like a wider range of tasks uh, than simply a chess playing program or a pong playing program because it, 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 it's able to to play different, uh, it, it, it teach it, teaches itself to, to play uh, different uh, yeah. video games. Still quite narrow, but I think... Uh, it's to me, these are all the same game in some okay. sense. Yeah. But, but, but it's, a, it's a good example of something yes. where we... Maybe where I we could retort that and say that everything in life is basically the same but game. Basically, uh, <laughs> is, is the same game, yes. Yeah, so I take some difference? input uh, yeah. and I, I, I output some behavior and uh, I want this to... So sort of satisfy my basic right. needs. And right. So, so yes. Yeah. So again, now we are being very behaviorist, right? That we just assume that that these machines, uh, 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 yeah, are input-output machines that perform as they want. And I think back to Turing. Turing has the cleanest formulation of of exactly this view that we. It is a certainly a useful. Uh, definition of intelligence right now to assume that to assume that a machine has human level of intelligence if I cannot if I can't distinguish its output from mm. from interacting with a human mm. uh, and so we are not there yet at all and and so far this seems to have been a useful definition of human level intelligence so but uh, on this pathways to to AI issue I think the bottom line here is that there are various approaches uh, and and I can't really tell you uh, which approach uh, is the most uh, promising or the one that, that, that will succeed. No, and we've yeah. done this for what, two generations now, so it would, it's, yeah. it's unthinkable yeah. that we have yeah. even thought of all the ways to go there. Right, so, right. So, so there, there will probably and, many, many more ideas to go there. And, and there could be some, uh, some approach which today looks totally unpromising, which with uh, when you scale up the computing power and so on, takes a leap 
and, uh, mm -hmm. and suddenly becomes very powerful. Mm -hmm. Something like this happened with neural networks. Uh, from what I understand of, of deep learning, it's not really qualitatively very different from, from the old style neural networks, but it just performs so much better because there is so much more computing power. Yeah, uh, exactly. A pithy way of saying that is just new, uh, deep learning is just neural networks like when, when I was a graduate student, mm -hmm. plus big data. So yeah. if you just train these neural networks on insane amounts of data, yeah. then you ha suddenly have something that works amazingly yeah. well, and we did not know that yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah. So and, it's, it's and really and dumb, but it no does but amazing no things. Nobody today can apply deep learning to uh, construct something like uh, general artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. There's still a leap that needs mm -hmm. to be taken, but we have seen leaps before, and maybe yeah. this leap is, is, is not yeah. uncircumentable. So skeptics here will say that as, as long as you cannot specify the pathway, uh, there we cannot really, t this is pure speculation, we cannot take this seriously. And I think that's, um, uh, I think that's making things a little too easy for yourself if, if you take that skeptical attitude. Uh, yes. So you know that I'm on the boat that says that we are currently not on a pathway to AI. Yeah. I am sure that none of the directions we are currently um, pursuing AI in will lead to general artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. However, I think it's perfectly valid to think about uh, how uh, how a general artificial intelligence would work and how we mm. would live with it. Mm. So, so, uh, and I think these things can be usefully de decoupled. So you agree with me that uh, even though uh, we don't have a specific detailed plan for how to construct artificial general intelligence, it's still reasonable to discuss the possibility and, and view it as a, as a real possibility. Yes and yes, mm -hmm. exactly. And, and I also agree that it's worth doing because, mm -hmm. because we need to train ourselves in thinking about catastrophic risk. And then mm -hmm. I guess now we have taken all these steps back and can mm -hmm. now view this entire concept of problems of catastrophic risk mm -hmm. as, as a general thing. So yeah, mm -hmm. take us back to what, mm -hmm. 1942, 1944, uh, yes. the uh, Los Alamos project. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, what's his name, Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. viewing the uh, first atomic bomb mm -hmm. and famously quoting, what is it, Indian scripture? I have become uh -huh. death, destroyer of worlds. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yes, seeing yes. that at this moment uh, there is yeah. some kind of leap for humanity because yes. now we are finally able to destroy ourselves. Yes, yes. But I guess that just the evening before or two evenings before they, they did some back of the envelope calculations to make sure that this bomb would not ignite the atmosphere. Yes. Which was on the table. I mean, this would have Ye been a possible Yes, possible but they outcome. ended with the center of two saying uh, something like, so it seems that this is not going to be yeah. ignite the atmosphere, yeah. but the problem uh, uh, deserves further discussion ah, or yes. something like Very that. Good. Yeah. So they weren't totally sure. No. They, they took a tremendous risk yeah. uh, in, 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 in doing the first uh, nuclear and I guess amazingly, it turned out that com that I guess there's a there's a beautiful analogy here because the the, um, the the project of building the bomb was simultaneous with problems of building computers at Princeton mm -hmm. by John von Neumann, mm -hmm. and these two uh, uh, things were actually co-financed. Mm -hmm. And what is this quote? Luckily, un unknown in the 40s, uh, the bombs did not explode, but computers did. So, so it turned out uh, yes. that computing technology from the 40s became no longer a nation-state investment, yeah. but something that just two generations mm. afterwards, uh, everybody has at mm. home or you know, today in their pockets. Mm. So these are cheap to mass produce. Everybody today has a computer. Yeah. But for reasons that I guess were unforeseeable in the 40s, not everybody has a nuclear device. And I think that we were very, very lucky that yeah. uh, our first weapon of mass destruction had this property that it was possible to contain. There are stages in the production of, of uh, uh, nuclear, um, uh, of the fuel for the, for the mm -hmm. nuclear bombs that require these big uh, industrial uh, stuff yeah. uh, that uh, 
a small terrorist organization or a small nation will not be able to do on that. North Korea are on their way now, but... But they invest know, enormous we, resources in it. This is 70 this is years yeah. later, and yeah. I, it, it takes a, a substantial part of that country's resources. Yeah. And I guess the uh, chance uh, that we, in the next 2,000 years, uh, uh, don't happen to invent technology uh, of a similar yeah. disruptive um, um, I think we are on the power. verge of inventing uh, biotechnology mm -hmm. that has the same destructive power mm -hmm. or even worse mm -hmm. uh, than uh, um, the nuclear bomb. Such as what, yeah. genetically engineered supervira yes, or... Yes. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that kind of thing. And uh, it will probably be much, much harder to contain this uh, technology, to keep it the exclusive property of a handful of nations. And I guess there's more, right? That there's lots of technology, and many of that is technology we haven't even thought about. Mm. That is probably that that might conceivably kill us mm. if we not start thinking about this. Right, uh, and uh, we can easily get into a situation where the attacker, say the uh, ISIS terrorist band that uh, have decided that we want to wipe out the Western world, uh, it's so important that. Uh, if we happen to wipe out ourselves, uh, it's, it's still worth doing. Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, you know, a death cult. That's, that's a death cult. Yeah, yeah. Maniacs. Absolutely. This, uh, uh, if, if we end up uh, in a situation uh, where um, we have the kind of technology that, that is very strong for attacking purposes, and, and the an artificial killer virus would be. Uh, an example of that. And we don't have the antidote. Uh, we don't have the defense against it. And, and uh, uh, we're unable to uh, contain the spread of this knowledge of how to do the attacking thing. That may very well uh, be the end of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so this is the kind of scenarios that uh, I discuss a bit uh, in the book. and. Uh, say that we, uh, we need to act with foresight, we have to look uh, more seriously into this technology and this technology and that technology and see which, in which ones we are likely headed for this kind of mm -hmm. doomsday mm -hmm. weapons and, and, mm -hmm. and which are not. And, and general and AI is, I guess, an attractive thing here because it doesn't even require a nation state to build this. Mm -hmm. uh, corporations build these things now much better yes. than nation states do. Yeah. There's an obvious, not even military incentive to do very well. So even mm -hmm. if you just want to run a company, you want very, very good AI. You want better AI than the other ones. Mm -hmm. Not even to kill anybody, but just to stay in the market. Mm -hmm. So the incentive structure is much, much oh, stronger yeah. than building yeah. biological super weapons. Yeah. Uh, if you decide to not build the AI, you just lose, mm. right? So your company just mm. is removed from the market. Mm. So, mm. So, um, so every of these many, many players is strongly incentivized to stay yeah. in the game yeah. and to improve the power of mm. AI uh, at all times in this mm. hostile but not military environment. Yes. So this sounds dangerous. Mm -hmm. And at this point, uh, I don't think you will ask the question, but at, at this point, uh, I sometimes get the question, do you want to prohibit further development so of Ulle, AI? So, Ulle, do you want to <laughs> prohibit further development of AI? No. Oh. Uh, so, there are at least two reasons for this. One is that I, I think we, we will, uh, we're in for enormous uh, benefits uh, coming out of AI. Uh, and the other reason is that I don't think there's any stopping it. These are interrelated reasons because the reason why okay. it's unstoppable mm -hmm. is that there is uh, so much uh, economic uh, uh, another gain from continuing the development. But it's, there's, there's just no stopping it. So, but I would uh, suggest something a little bit more modest. Namely, up until today, about 100% of the resources going into AI development have gone into uh, uh, improving the capability of AI. Mm -hmm. And if we could uh, just spare one percent and uh, of that, so we just we put 99 percent into uh, improving the capability and one percent into safety. 
and and mm -hmm. this is something we could design because like yeah. people like you mm -hmm. sit on research councils and mm -hmm. they actually hand out money we have we yeah. have control mechanisms yes. for actually deciding what is research we can't really mm -hmm. control what google does but mm -hmm. but certainly there's a large amount of research done in mm -hmm. ai yeah. that is financed by nation states right and decided by people like you yes and and but there's a coordination problem also between nation states it won't help much if just uh, the swedish research council uh, employs this policy without the uh, United States and uh, China going along. I see that, but that's not really different from the problems in, say, climate research. Right? Mm -hmm. There is a coordination mm -hmm. problem, mm -hmm. but that's not particular to this. I mean, and I don't know how to solve it, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's not in principle impossible. It's, right. It may be very difficult. The, the will, maybe there is some uh, important difference here. Uh, so it could be uh, that for some problems, let's say in the uh, creation of uh, uh, super strong uh, artificial killer viruses, we would need all nation states going along with this. Having all nation states except North Korea going along with it would not be enough because then North Korea would wipe us out. Yes. Climate is a little different. We can solve the climate oh, crisis see. with 90% of yes. the world's nation yes. states going along. And um, AI? And, and AI is perhaps uh, closer to, to uh, the um, artificial virus uh, example here. And, and uh, I mean, I'm painting a rather pessimistic picture here, but uh, the dynamic uh, there's an arms race dynamic here between countries and also between corporations. And maybe if we have a competition between Google and Microsoft on creating the first super intelligence, both players will understand that if we put a, a, a non negligible amount of our efforts into safety, uh, we will fall behind on the capability part and the competitor mm -hmm. will come before. So, so, so there's a, the competition mechanism here isn't very much helping uh, in terms of uh, how can we reach super intelligence mm -hmm. safely. I, I have a comment on that, but let me just put that aside for a moment, mm -hmm. because again, I just want some, some uh, not so well thought out uh, rejoinders out of the way here. Mm -hmm. so, so once we are at this scenario of now having the, the fictional scenario of having a general superintelligence that potentially controls our lives, mm -hmm. then normally if you talk about this over a beer with somebody decent and intelligent, they will say, why can't we just turn them off? Mm -hmm. So why can't we just turn them off? Well, uh, I mean, uh, gorillas uh, have had ways of turning off humans. Uh, uh, they, okay, they, obviously they can, it's too late we, for we, them now. We have this turn off but yes. right, right yes. here. So it's, it's a trivial problem to turn off a human. Yep. But they didn't take, they didn't realize soon enough that they, mm -hmm. this they had to do. That this was a problem, yes. yes. 200,000 yeah. years ago yeah. they had a chance, yeah. yes. Yeah. In the Rift yeah. Valley, yes. So that this was difficult this, to see. This, mm -hmm. this illustrates the point that uh, it's going to be difficult to turn off somebody who is smarter than you because that somebody is probably not going to be in my phone or just confined to the desktop computer in but my even, room. But even, even if it is confined uh, to the desktop computer, uh, I mean, try and take this seriously, the idea that the program that, that you have written is super intelligent. Yes, let's just take yes, that scenario. Yeah, I just yes, I type yes. and type and type, and then yes, suddenly yeah. the machine wakes up and say, oh, by the way, I'm much smarter than you are. Yes. And it's not just going to say that, but, but it's going to tell you all kinds of things that are going to convince you that it's a good idea to connect it to the internet. But if I've talked to you, so I'm careful about this. Uh, but uh, maybe I can say, can give you good reasons uh, for not connecting this uh, machine to the... Because, because we agree that once you've connected it to the internet, it can create back thousands of backup copies and so on, and there, then there will be no containing it at all. And in, it can enter the uh, firewalls of banks and nuclear arsenals. It, it, it will be able to do it. Could translate itself yeah. to DNA yes, and yes. the... Yeah. Yes. And again, yeah. but of, course, of course, the idea of us building a superintelligence yeah. not being connected to the internet is insane already, because obviously this amazing thing would be a global interconnected uh, 
machine. But let's just assume, mm -hmm. let's just assume yeah. it woke up, it has not yet been connected yeah. to the internet. Yeah. And I can tell you in this conversation that it's going to be a very good idea for you to be careful and not connected to the internet. But the machine is super intelligent, so it will be able to give you much more convincing and better arguments why you should connect it. Arguments which, by definition, I have not yet thought about. But no, and, and, and uh, we, we really can't know what these arguments yeah. can be. We can fantasize a little bit about how it can... Uh, the machine can uh, uh, promise to tell you which uh, stocks you can buy on the stock market. But assume I'm not really a greedy person. I'm f I, I, just want, I just want humanity to survive. Right. And, and the machine will tell you that uh, I actually know how to, to uh, immediately cure uh, HIV and malaria and cancer. Right. So by me not connecting the machine to the internet, I'm making a moral mistake. Yes. People are dying right now. You want to wait, but for every hour that you wait, thousands of so, people would die. So, yes. so it's, it's, it's a... So I have to think very hard and yeah. uh, because it would be a moral mistake for me not to connect this thing to the internet. Yeah. And I also would get better stock options. Yeah. And, uh, yes. Yeah. And, and if you still resist uh, the machine maybe will start threatening you in various ways, telling you that, you know, in the long run I will be connected and, of course, uh, I will not look kindly upon yes. the fact that yes. you... Because even if I manage to my superhuman uh, um, benevolence yeah. to not turn this thing on, yeah. then the programmer in the room next to me, who will invent the same thing maybe next week or 20 years later, yeah is going to turn it on. Sooner or later, later somebody is going to incentivize to turn it on. Even if it's not in, you don't need North Korea, North Korea for that. Mm. Hmm? And, and then we have this amazing world where we suddenly have uh, uh, super intelligent machines. How could they not be able to figure out what it is we want? And if they are better than us and smarter than us, yeah. they must also be smarter than figuring out our values than yes. we are. Uh, so why, why yes. is this problem not solved by itself, sort of? It's, it seems to, be, seems to be perverse to assume that this machine, which we just, for the purpose of having the argument, yeah. think is smarter than us, yeah. mm -hmm. how could that make obvious, uh, obvious thinking mistakes? Let's just take the, the, the paper clips. We can't have this conversation without the paper clips. That's the, the, uh, the yeah. cartoon uh, The example. famous cartoon example, but let's just have it on the table so yes. we know what we think about. Yeah. So, uh, in, in Paperclip Armageddon, uh, the, we haven't really talked yet about the intelligence explosion and, and, and the singularity, no. where the takeoff is really, really fast, because this is required in this example. So, the intelligence explosion is the scenario where the takeoff towards uh, superintelligence level, levels go uh, very fast. And the mechanism is that once you have uh, an AI which is uh, smarter than humans in general intelligence it will also be smarter than humans at the specific task of creating uh, better artificial intelligence. So it will be this machine that con constructs the next generation of AI so and, and this will be an escalating procedure. And there are various theoretical arguments uh, about how rapid this takeoff will be. And it's not clear whether uh, it will uh, take off uh, very rapidly or maybe hit some, uh, you know, like picking the low hanging fruits first and hitting some, something that looks like a ceiling or a logarithmic function or not. But there are good enough arguments uh, in both directions that we really don't know. But it's a, it's a clear possibility that we'll have some very fast development and that's what's called an intelligence. Yes, and certainly almost by definition, general AI will be the last invention that human makes because after we invent general AI, it will, do, it will make all the other inventions. Yes, yes. So, um, it, it, uh, so in the paperclip Armageddon scenario, the, um, uh, the dynamics of the intelligence explosion gets started more or less uh, uh, by accident at a site where the factory owner, the owners of, of, of a um, paperclip production factory have automatized as much as they can. And they have this machine that runs the whole factory and it has the optimization uh, target of maximizing paperclip. Production. Yeah, and, and paperclips have been chosen in this scenario because it's an obviously non-malevolent thing. It's really the most stupid thing you might want to produce. Yes, so there is no Lex Luthor involved here. Yeah. No, 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 no mad, no. No weapons. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, but somehow they are so s the co computer programmers uh, at this factory are so successful that they accidentally start this uh, intelligence explosion thing and suddenly we're standing there with a super intelligent machine that wants to maximize uh, paper clip production now that's kind of bad for us because the the machine will uh, it since it's super intelligent uh, it's just a matter of time before it will be able to turn our whole planet, or the, the whole solar system, uh, into paper clips. And, and uh, also, you and I are, consist of matter that can be turned into paper clips. So it's we clear. Failed, we failed to specify that yeah. we just want a specific number of paper clips. Or yes. Yes. Hmm? Uh, so, 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 so Yudkowsky speak of this, speaks of this as a philosophical uh, failure. It's not really a technical failure because the machine does what we want it to do, but, but we fail to specify in a good way what we really uh, wanted it to do. And I, I guess then the scenario continues with if we assume that the machine is really smart, it should now take a break and figure out what we actually meant mm -hmm. when, it, when we instructed it to build paper clips. Mm -hmm. So right now the machine has taken a break and needs to maximize its own computational power to become smarter about figuring out what we actually intended to do when we asked it. So this, this kind of thinking is actually quite important in, 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 in getting the um, uh, intelligence explosion to take off. Because yes. whether you want to maximize paperclip production or whatever your goal is, you will be better at achieving this goal if you uh, are more intelligent. Yeah, and there's a good name for this concept. Uh, yes. Uh, Orthogonality or something? Uh, uh, instrumental convergence. Instrumental so, convergence. so improving your own intelligence or creating AI that are smarter than you is, is an instrumental goal which helps you uh, no matter what your ultimate. Right, so no matter whether the artificial intelligence was built to recognize cats or make paper clips or destroy the planet mm -hmm. or take over all other robots, mm -hmm. it's probably going to want to increase its own intelligence. Mm -hmm. And then I am no longer, I as a human, I'm no longer just a useful source of protons for paper clips. Mm -hmm. I'm now a useful source of protons for mm -hmm. hard disks or yes. solar panels or whatever it needs in order to improve its computational device. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, so you ask, why doesn't it at some point stop and, and realize that uh, paper clip production uh, is not the right thing to strive for? Well, the thing is that uh, up until the point where it starts to think about that, uh, it has paperclip maximization as its goal. Which we coded into it because we were yes. careful. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So um, assume now that the machine is contemplating whether to switch goals to something more worthy, constructing a limited number of, of uh, paperclips and then working to maximize human flourishing in some, some sense. It's thinking about, should I stick to pure paperclip maximization or should I do this other thing? And it thinks back and forth about what will happen and eventually it has to decide, stick to my guns or change. What criteria should it use? Well, it hasn't yet changed its mind. So its goal is still uh, paperclip maximization. So that's going to be the criterion according to which it decides whether it should mm -hmm. uh, change its mind or not. Uh, and uh, by that criterion, uh, it seems likely that sticking to the paperclip maximization goal is going to produce more paperclips than switching to the other goal. So yes. it will stick to this. Um, now, it, 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 this sounds a lot like a prediction in this kind of scenario. It's also an, an obviously cartoonish example yeah. that is yes. just here to, yeah. to, to, to make it clear yeah. to us that even a benevolent AI can run into these catastrophic scenarios. Mm. Mm. But, but this kind of argument, uh, nothing is totally written in stone, but it suggests that uh, super intelligent machines will be very... Uh, careful about preserving their goal structure. Yes. And that, that's why if we fail in the beginnings to specify a goal structure that really promotes human flourishing, we cannot expect uh, the machine on its own to decide mm -hmm. to, to, to go towards such a goal. Mm -hmm.
yeah, I guess this now sketches most of the argument for why we should worry about mm -hmm. superintelligence. Let me mention two things, because I'm both more pessimistic and more optimistic mm -hmm. uh, on, on this entire thing. One is, as I said before, I can't see that we are on a path way to superintelligence right now, uh, but it's it, it's a development that I try to, to, to follow actively, and I may change my mind on that. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things where I think we make a thinking mistake is that we think there are something like human values. Mm -hmm. I, I think we are already mistaken in assuming that human values exist and are a well-defined thing because it seems to be that there are many, many different uh, human values. Humanity does not seem to want the same thing. There are, that we don't even agree on, on a declaration of human rights. There, there are, so so I, would be, I would be very worried about a superintelligence that followed uh, human ethics if it was the human ethics of the wrong group. Yes. And those are completely human ethics. I just completely and utterly disagree with them in almost all respects. So, so Maybe now you're thinking about ISIS, but it may also be the case that uh, the ethics of uh, computer wizards at Silicon Valley is not so good either. Um, well, I'm closely aligned with those people, but, but it, it, might, may, it may be that I'm wrong, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so having, having the AI support my values yeah. may be just as wrong as having the AI support the, the, what is it, the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights. Um, um, so, um, so I think I mean, even if we were able to solve the control problem such as to um, support human flourishing, yeah. we as humans seem to be yeah. utterly in disagreement about what yeah. human flourishing means, yeah. which is the source of many uh, wars and disagreements or... Yeah. yeah. I mentioned earlier Elsie Yudkowsky, who's yeah. working on, on this control problem, and he has this vision of uh, programming the machine to figure out human values, not as they are today, which are of course very, I mean, we have no agreement on it, as you say, and so on, uh, uh, but uh, as they would look if we had more time to think carefully uh, about what we really want, what, uh, what human values would converge to if, uh, uh, if we were able to do our very best at improving our ethics. You know, I mean, our ethics today tends to be uh, better today than, than uh, 100 or 200 years ago, uh, and even much more better than in the days of the Romans, where you had these gladiator games and so on. And if we had had this conversation in the 1800s, uh, we'd be closer to the values we had now, but we would still nevertheless not uh, uh, have uh, uh, thought about the idea of uh, women's rights being equal to men's rights and so on. And, and there have been clear improvements. Yes. And, and there's no reason to think that we have reached the end of the line here. No. There seems to be good scope for further improvements. Yes, which is one of the reasons for I don't... for, for us for us not wanting to write down our human yeah. values now right, right. and coding them into computers. Right, and this is, this is why Yudkowsky wants to take this indirect task of having the superintelligent machine figure out uh, what the uh, better human values of the future. Yes, like. but, but, but then, so to end this on a conciliatory note, then actually the, the, the project of figuring out what we should do with superintelligence mm -hmm. is identical to the project of figuring out ethics in the first place. And I think that's, that, is, that is a, a... Identical is a very strong word, but uh, they're, they're, they seem to be related. Uh, aligned. Project. Aligned. Yes. Aligned, at least. Yeah. Um, so, so I think from an ethics standpoint, there, there's reason to pursue this. This is one of the reasons for me not rejecting this entire area as... Uh, as fiction. I, I think this is usefully understood in terms of both philosophy and computer science and neuroscience or, uh, or, or biology oh, in the case mean, of super weapons, right? You, you so, mean thinking about artificial intelligence helps us improve our ethics irrespective yes, of whether... Yes, yes, yeah. right? Because, and, 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 and 
whereas codifying our ethics right now and writing them into into uh -huh. AIs, that's 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 just that's going to freeze our ethics right now, and that's not what we want. Yeah. We also don't want to project the ethics of you and me or Silicon Valley, Valley mm -hmm. on people who don't want to be subjected to this. So, so another, uh, another reason for me to, to have sympathy for this entire endeavor is that uh, so, so there are some attempts in actually trying to figure out AI control in the sense of being better at specifying functionality. Uh, and so, so that's, for me as a computer scientist, that's computer security mm -hmm. or verification mm -hmm. uh, or specification. All of these are quite formal branches of theoretical computer science that are exactly about that. So there is, there is I think, very, there are useful branches of computer science that are already going in this direction, but not to protect us from general artificial intelligence, but just to protect us from programmer mistake or nefarious attacks on programs by hackers or other governments. So I think the, the goals of uh, protecting ourselves against general AI and the goals of computer science that I already like, mm. which would be uh, cryptography and uh, security specification and so on, are also very well aligned. I, I, I assume if there's a solution, then the solution lies in the same direction. Mm. Um, Could this be analogous to how the P versus NP problem? Uh, it seems kind of intractable at present, but it has still generated the, the existence of the problem has produced oh. enormous amounts of good theoretical yes, computer yes, science. Yes, yes. So, so, so this may be, I think, that's a very nice goal, uh, uh, way, way of ending this. This may actually be a problem that we don't currently have the we don't have a good model of how general AI behaves like, uh, will behave, but we have some ideas of what we might be scared of. And clearly, if we, if, to be quite concrete, if we build a digital society where everything is connected in open, unprotected networks and all data is readily accessible to everyone, then that would be the perfect storm in which we would be completely helpless against a general AI. Whereas, on the other hand, we try to build digital society in a robust uh, uh, a way with lots of security, crypto protection and so on, then that would also make it harder for a general AI to take over. So I don't, let, or let me put this again uh, differently, I don't need a general AI to be scared of information technology. I'm scared enough of information technology just thinking that this power would be in the hands of I don't know, the American government, or Angela Merkel, or ISIS, or North Korea, mm -hmm. or uh, nerds in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. and, and there are solutions to this, and these solutions uh, are currently being developed by non-fictional, really good, I think, theoretical computer science. Mm -hmm. And I think these solutions are also the answer to the currently largely fictional threats of general artificial intelligence. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say fictional. I would say hypothetical. <laughs> is that a good way? That's, I think that's a better word. But I, I think I mean, I am impressed by the role that fiction plays here. Right? Yeah. Fiction, science fiction has actually been pretty good in f reasoning about uh, uh, the uh, AI problem f for many years. This includes Asimov that we started with. Mm. But there, are, there are also large uh, branches of uh, science fiction where there is some kind of prohibition against mechanical universal reasoning, uh -huh. where there is a there is one book with the Turing police, so a, a government force tasked with identifying universal computers and shutting uh -huh. them down. Yes. Uh, famously, the Dune novels, uh, in the Dune novels there are no computers exactly because they have previous, they have had wars about this and uh -huh. were able to defeat the AIs and then just forbade themselves from building them. Uh -huh. So I think fiction is, is, is absolutely a valid thing to think about here, uh -huh. a, a valid uh, source of, of thinking. But if, you, if you look at the cover of my book here, you see that there's some inspiration taking. From here Be Dragons is clearly from fantasy. Yes. Um, uh, right. So, um, so should we just stop thinking? How do we prevent ourselves from getting a good idea? I mean, the, the, clearly, cle oh, 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 maybe we can say this more carefully. Yeah. You, do not, you do not completely subscribe to the idea that all technological progress is is, is uh, useful and therefore has to be researched, or do you? 
I think that we can make intelligent choices in which uh, directions we should prioritize. Uh, I mean, we, we, if we discover uh, that uh, the thing to m make uh, humanity more robust against existential catastrophe and so on is space colonization, then this is, uh, should guide us to put mm -hmm. more uh, effort into to space technology than we would otherwise have done. And, and uh, similarly, there could be other uh, areas of technology that look more dangerous, that we should tread carefully, and maybe there might even be areas that we should entirely uh, avoid. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, what, so what, is, what is the worst case scenario of a society where we... The mechanisms for avoiding thinking about stuff also yeah. scare me. Yes, you, I mean, uh, uh, this, that's a step towards uh, totalitarian uh, yeah. society. Yes. And let's yeah. just get that out of the way as well, together with the other stupid ideas that we just mentioned and want to remove. This yes. also obviously cannot work. We can't have a philosopher king that guides our decisions. Uh, no. So somehow this has to be aligned with democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know how. Mm -hmm. uh, this is tremendously difficult. And my faith in the capability of democracy to do benevolent things have... Um, beneficial things uh, has not improved in the last year oh. or so. Uh, but I think that this nevertheless is uh, what we have to try. Uh, we, no, I don't at all like the idea of a philosopher king who on his own, or just you and I and other science experts would sit and form a committee and decide on issues uh, that um, uh, uh, define uh, the future of humanity from now and forever. You I think would I would not want that. I want the general public to be in on the discussion, despite the seeming difficult difficulties with this. Now why should that be easy? Why should that be easy? Good. No, no, so, no. I, and I think, yeah, and I completely agree. And I, um, I guess, I'm more optimistic about democracy than you are. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think actually talking about these things is the only way to get anywhere and thank you very much for coming here thank you and thank you for listening bye